are really getting into so deep. And what I'm going to um, present to you is a little bit uh, off track, but uh, still coming back to this core concept of ultra stability. Uh, title is the ultra stable system hypothesis question mark and uh, layers or types of uh, emergence of uh, ultra stability again question mark because I only bring you the things that I'm confused myself so perhaps you can offer some guidance. Uh, first, uh, some historical picture. This was this is me. Uh, well, this was me, and uh, this guy is the attention I want to bring you to. His name is Jin Guan Tao, and uh, we were a group of uh, so-called rebellion groups in 1980s. Uh, this is him, uh, Jin again, and this is me, and this is uh, his wife, and uh, the couple worked together for more than 10 years uh, to come up with this thing I'm going to let you know today. And uh, this is the group that uh, had a, uh, my first conference, I mean, the, the national conference held in 1982. Uh, the name is the Academic, Dis Academic Conference of about the reasons of the Chinese science and technology are so backward. So, so that was these people getting together to find out what's wrong with China. And uh, he, and he's here again, uh, if you can see the, uh, you see, I'm here and he's here. So he was a pioneering young scholar who applied the cybernetics and the system science concepts to deal with Chinese society problems. His name was Jin Guan Tao, or I will call him GT Jin here. I think Klaus is here. I think he, he did one year uh, work uh, as a visiting scholar with Klaus at UPenn, uh, also back in 80s. So the idea, oh, okay, three arrows pointing to him. Uh, so uh, this is his, my highlight here. The idea is that uh, he, I didn't know where he get it, but uh, he, he said the definition of ultra stability is that uh, the system crashes itself due to the increase of disorganizational forces, rising and the passing a uh, threshold a long time. So the system crash itself and reorganize itself back into the exactly same structure. Well, this definition is certainly different from our standard one that uh, on, on Principia uh, Cybernetica web. Okay, uh, I think uh, Francis Halligan and uh, Cliff uh, Jocelyn had this Ultra stability definition. That's why I'm curious uh, to ask Mana, uh, Mana, uh, what exactly, how Ashby himself defined ultra stability. I mean, the distinguish, distinguish. Uh, sorry, I missed my screen. Uh, the the distinction he made between the regular stable e equilibrium and uh, the term ultra stability. Now. Now this is what he said, the uh, ultra stability behavior curve and time and uh, status, order status. Now, the, the lower part of this diagram is the actual statistical data about uh, Chinese dynasty, uh, dynasties in terms of uh, uh, the X, the X, uh, X, no, X, X is the time, the year, and uh, Y axis is the social order. <coughs> so somehow they, they did a measurement there. So you can see that uh, the society crashed to a low order state and uh, come back to the order state and the crash again, crash again, crash again. And uh, the whole Chinese history, it crashed 13 times 
Interestingly, it never evolved to into new structure. So each time a new dynasty is established, the, the social structure, political structure, economic structure, and the cultural structure are exactly the same as the previous dynasty. So G.T. Jin and his wife, they did the first research on this issue in 1974. That was before Mao's death during Cultural Revolution. And they first published in 1981 and, and there's a second edition of the book published in 1992. So uh, the, the name of this book is The Cycle of Growth and Decline on the Ultra-Stable Structure of Chinese Society. And it was published by Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, my question is, this is a pending issue that uh, has not reached to consensus to at least for people doing study on this issue. And Jing had several unique thoughts that worth our attention here. First, he, he put this thing called the social anthropy equals disorganizational force. Like we had discussed about the, the, the cybernetic uh, homeostasis uh, feedback mechanism as uh, organizational forces. Uh, in Manos word, it cancels the bad information so it uh, keep the system survive. But social enthropy, he used is something something exists grows into inside the system that uh, dis disorganize the status. Uh, one typical example would be corruption. And under Chinese culture, uh, in Chinese social institutions, corruption, no, is not something to be countered, uh, but a, a lubricant for the running of the bureaucratic machine. So it's a different value system there, uh, number one. Uh, and. Uh, he also had this concept of, uh, actually he, he discovered this, the concept of a state and a family is isomorphic. It's the, see Chinese word country, uh, number one, they do not have a distinction between a nation, a country, a state and a government. So nation, state, country, government are all called guojia and guo means state, jia means home, family. So, so remember there is no concept, uh, Klaus and Larry emphasize on the importance of a language. In, in Chinese language, there is no concept of uh, this distinct, uh, 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 distinguished, uh, um, state, government, uh, nation, and the country. It's all guo jia, and the guo is means this big thing, and the jia means a family. And if you deconstruct further, the character, Chinese character jia means home and family or family is a roof. You draw a roof on top of a pig. So yes. there you have a pig raised somewhere and you have a roof above the pig, then you have a home. Is, is this also including the Communist Party? Kocha is also? Uh, yeah, so, so that just for that one word, you can see how this different cultural context, they, their logic and their thinking style are totally different. Now, now Jin tries to explain why this ultra stability is observed by identifying, okay, the structure is supposed to be the same, the state and the family. Therefore, in a family, Confucius defined your family order as 
as a father and a son and uh, husband and wife and uh, old brother and younger brother, blah, blah, blah. And so he defined this, the right order of a family. Now, when the Western culture came in and the Chinese start getting the concept of uh, state, they say state family. So, so it's a big family. So it, uh, Xi Jinping is like uh, the big boss of the family. Uh, so that is their way of seeing things. So because this isomorphy is there, therefore each time the dynasty crashes uh, by rebellions or, or external invasion, they, uh, when time getting to the rebuild, they rebuild exactly the same structure. So there is no evolution in 2000 years. It has years. been 50 years of communism. 50 years of communism must make it, must make a difference. Uh, must that, that's Marx. another story because uh, communism is also, uh, also Western ideas coming in. I mean, yes. Karl Marx is a German so, and Lenin came from USSR. So, so it's all messed up by the external forces. But uh, for its original local uh, local ecology, it, it was supposed to be un, uh, uh, ultra stable. And so, so the point is there's no evolution uh, in 2000 years. And also there is this thing called the unification doctrine that nowadays uh, Xi Jinping is, is promoting it again. As, because uh, I just mentioned that there were no concept of uh, state. So before the state, before people get the word of name, the state, the, 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 at the place of uh, this thing is called all under heaven, Tianxia. So that's why uh, the Chinese dynasties is never, uh, never uh, behaved like a, a nation state because there's no concept of nation state. So, so the Jin's hypothesis is because the isomorphy of between state and the family and this unification doctrine. So Chinese society always rebuilt itself. Now, I have one more slide here. Uh, he had the four possible evolutionary pathways. Uh, he pointed out that's four kind of possibility. The first is the long time static stagnation, like those primitive tribes. And the second is the Chinese fate, with uh, ultra stability, traditional Chinese society. The third type is what the West had experienced structural evolution. Uh, there's more uh, adaptation, more adjustment inside. So, so as the time goes by, uh, you have new you have a different uh, structure uh, dealing with the, the new environment. So from Asian to Greece, should be Greece, sorry, and Roman Empire and the West. And the last one is of course distinction, uh, disappear, those disappeared uh, of civilizations. The interesting thing is he identified the four basic variables that determined the, the above four fates. The first, a variable is the speed of the increase of disorganizational forces. So, so in some system, the enthalpy jumps up very fast. Uh, and so your control mechanism cannot uh, catch up. So, so that is the speed uh, of uh, disorganization. Uh, second is uh, availability of potential structures. Uh, in other words, NGOs, new kind of organizations, new churches, uh, or democratic structures. Uh, uh, the third one is whether the disorganizational forces can be clear, uh, cleaned after change. Some can be wiped very clean, some still uh, may still left over there. And the last one is whether the old structure has a rebuilt mechanism which he identified that the Chinese had that rebuilt mechanism. 
but at that time, I'm not sure he is aware of Ashby's uh, law of requested variety. And perhaps law of a various uh, requested variety should be linked to all these four variables or something independent. So my last slide is my question to all of you. Is this hypothesis right or wrong? I mean, Stuart says it's not a hypothesis description, but either way, is the description right or wrong? Is this, uh, this thing crash by itself and then recover itself can be called ultra stability? Or is this a different from Aspie's original concept? Is there, uh, so, so if there's a difference on the definition, then how do we reconcile those differences? And uh, it, more interestingly, what are the relationships or distinctions of this group of terms? I collected a little, they are more or less talking about the capacity to coming back to original status or not to be disturbed by the external forces. So from a simple resistance to toughness, to endurance, to robustness, uh, perseverance, grit, stability, adaptability, uh, elasticity, resilience, uh, ultra stability and sustainability. So, so if you are given a a test of how do you link these 12 different concepts. My guess is uh, if it's they will have a spectrum. Ability in there. Yeah, I still have one more. Okay, that's the seventh. So I have a guess here from a simple stability, uh, that is a thermostat. Or to sophisticated stabilities like as uh, adaptability and the learning and the ultra stability, for example, that uh, uh, either um, PCP definition or GT gene definition, are they on all on a continuous spectrum similar to the color spectrum? So I, I already raised this question earlier. Uh, maybe some system is more stable than other. And what some does PCP are more... mean? What does P PCP uh, mean? Uh, Principia cybernetic uh, uh, project. I think it's, okay. it's that a huge website they, they built there. A measurement of a cyber complexity index, is that possible? Uh, let me call it a CCI. Whatever you want to call it, along the spectrum, is that measurement that can be identified. Lloyd has just mentioned the Markov chain. And we know that the Russian cybernetician Lyapunov had a weird mathematical definition of Lyapunov potential function to measure the stability. Uh, for example, when you're talking about uh, the stability of your rocket, then uh, that's uh, the better rocket, a lousy rocket, right? Uh, and those are relevant to Ashby's law and relevant to all of the 12 concepts I just listed. So in natural systems, in biological entities, the CCI increases as the evolution of a species unfold for survival and stabilize within certain niche. Or, or if that niche become more and more tough, then the, the, the stability to handle the environment increasing. Or, or, or they just cannot survive. But in humans, uh, humans I define as uh, not just a biological, but a biological multiply psychological, psychological multiply social cultural. So it's a multi dimension entity. In, in this case, the CCI, if it exists, will increase, will increase through experience, education training, extreme special training. For example, that you have a strict thug who can fight. I you just use that a fighting uh, anal analogy. The average Joe have a certain capacity, but the Aikido fighter can do much better. And a Marine and a Navy SEAL and a Delta Force guy and James Bond, etc. 
can be measured by both requisite variety they possess. So, so that's my guess. And in robots, CCI we observed can be built to very high already. I, I just, the latest uh, Boston Dynamic uh, video, uh, the rock, the robot is now dancing, uh, for lotting, uh dances or all kinds of a jazz rock, uh, rock, rock and roll thing they can do. So that's my, um, how to say, my post of questions to you, uh, especially the SB experts. I'm not an HP, HP, HP expert, but I would like to say something. Uh, yeah, you uh, first, and uh, Klaus raised the hand. So after you, Klaus, too. after. Yeah. Uh, okay, Jamie, sir. <laughs> yeah. Please, Lloyd. Okay, uh, I would go for um, uh, theories about technological trajectories and technological regimes. Uh, so regimes are much more stable than trajectories because trajectories are like a river in a valley and they are in a landscape so they're three-dimensional trajectories emerge where different selection environments operate upon each other for example in mutual shaping and then you can say that some selections are selected for stabilization and you can say that some select stabilizations are selected for globalization at the regime level. So for example, the car is a technological regime. So it means that if you push on the car system, for example, with environmental legislation, you get the car system again. Uh, so, and Schumpeter is here very important. And I can even send you an article where I have some equations where I show that uh, if you, have a stable system you have a quadratic equation you need a valley and if you have a globalized system you need a three-dimensional system with a meter, meter stability point and a global optimum and a local optimum so, it, so there's just always a limit to the range i'm not sure i get it okay jamie jamie yeah uh yeah, my question was, um, I listened to the whole thing, so I'm not like focusing on something specific. And, and then I found it interesting, you say, is my hypothesis true or false? So that's the wrong question. You, uh, I think it should be, is my hypothesis interesting or not? And, and it's what not tested. Heard... <laughs> it cannot test, be tested. No, uh, interesting, and then you can, say like further pursuing, and I'm actually using Manel's time dimension. We're in an evolving, developing world. And when you ask it in that way, then I think it's a super interesting. And the missing dimension is actually the metaphors because you were using the family metaphor. And, and as a footnote, Lute was also throwing in a few metaphors, but, but to continue with the family metaphor, I found that very fascinating because basically what your your friend and colleague found is the dominance of that metaphor in the culture and how that metaphor adapted itself and and always was able to dominate and uh, so that the the metaphor of the adult uh, emancipated child, because as actually you could say Emmanuel Kant kind of introduced the idea of adults thinking for themselves as opposed to be children that listen to the Catholic Church. So that, that he introduced this new way of thinking like I can't think for myself, I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm going to try. And that, that somehow that metaphor is having trouble coming into China and maybe it's happening right now and there's a huge life or death struggle with the people who try to introduce that. But so I would add this dimension of metaphors to your research or to your friend's research. But the still the question is whether or not this is as ultra stability or it's something else. 
Mayana, you want to say something? Yes, thank you. Well, I think the research has, has a very interesting point and it relates a lot to cybernetics. So far, I, I, I have not spoken about the human world, but the cybernetic world is a prerequisite. So and anything, all the laws of the cybernetic world apply to the human world. By this, I'm saying that the, the human world is constituted by, before I, I already anticipated, uh, I, if, if the four sciences are uh, uh, aesthetics, uh, ethics, economics, and law, we already see that those four spheres are entangled in the human world. So basically you have a legal system, okay? You can link it to the state. You have the, the value system. You have the, 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 the arts, if you wish, very general. And, and you also uh, have the, the economics. So you have the goods that are provided uh, in, the, in the economy. So basically those four uh, aspects are entangled together and each, you see them in, the, in, in any human world that you look at. I mean, you can take a civilization because that's the biggest entity that we can think of. So not even the state, the actual civilization. If, if you take the Chinese civilization, and what, one interesting thing is that if you link it to, to Ashby, you can see that that is a recurring world, okay? In the sense that some of the values have lasted for centuries and millennia. The value of the family maybe comes from, from Confucius. And, and that's why maybe there's the no difference between the state and, and the family, because maybe he saw them as the same thing. And, and he saw that the, the value system uh, of the biggest entity that you can think of, in this case, the, the, the nation, if there, there was such a concept in, in Chinese or the state, is similar to the family because it's some, somehow an extension of the family. So I would say that the recurring system that, that you are seeing in that graph that you are saying, even if you change the dynasties, you haven't changed the values. So no matter who comes to power, the values are still the same. And therefore, there's ultra stability in the sense of to, 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 to make a change, you have to introduce uh, different values di uh, related to, to the legal system, which is not the case. In, in, so you have a legal system, but somehow the, the values that are entangled to that legal system are always the same. So I, I would say that ultra stability relates to, to the human world in the sense that it's explained a recurring world that the human being can change. So that's the difference between the cybernetic world and the human world, okay? The, the, the animal finds itself in a recurring world, which is repetitive, which if it, it has learned about it, it, it can anticipate certain changes and adapt. So it knows the season, it knows its prey, which are its prey, its predators, it, it, it knows the, the different uh, temperature that, that it can at different times of the year, it, needs, it knows it has to hibernate at certain moments. So that's somehow it's, it's become isomorphic with its environment in the sense that it can uh, adjust to it and it can anticipate, okay? But that's somehow a world that it cannot change. With okay, the, so the difference are... with the human world is that you can change that recurring world. And mm -hmm. you change it all the time, and we've done it in the, in the West. I mean, the, the notion of a, a, a nation state, that, that comes from the piece of Westphalia. I mean, before you had this uh, big kingdoms that somehow crossed all Europe and lots of parts. And then you had a moment in which they say, okay, well, we have to stop all these wars and we have to give each territory its own space and its own sovereignty. Okay, but that's something that wasn't there before. I mean, if you look at the medieval time, you, you can see that there was lots of dynasties that, that married dif different parts of Europe. And it wasn't clear the distinction between the different countries, but that somehow Something we, we, we did in, in the West. We, we also did it with the parliamentary system in England, you know, with the glorious revolution. So there was a, a mm -hmm. point in which they, they told the king, well, if you want to come back, you, you, you better respect the parliament uh, and what it's doing. And then that's when democracy came about. So somehow that recurring world has been constantly changing in the, in the West in the sense that it has been implementing all these ideas. I, I don't know enough, enough about Chinese, but somehow there's this uh, world somehow, which is regular, and maybe because there hasn't been a, a lot of changes due to, to that. And maybe a lot to do comes, comes down with the Confucian world hypothesis. This is how I wanted to end.
Very nice. Thank you. Stuart and uh, uh, lower, lower after Stuart. Well, I think we have two completely different conceptions of ultra stability here. When I listen to Ji Zhuan, he's talking about no change. You get the same dynasty structure 13 times in a row. But my interpretation of Ashby is that if you have these two feedback loops, the one inside the other, you have the possibility of change, but you also have the possibility of stability. And one of the things I didn't see on Ji Zhuan's list of 12 features was the concept of progress. I mean, the concept of progress has been very strong in the West. And uh, okay. we're, we're big believers in progress. I didn't see any progress. On well, we're talking about a stable, I mean, <laughs> not moving forward. And lower, lower you want to, you finish? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jason, I want to thank you for your grounded presentation because you're dealing with a, a concrete example that we need to be thinking about. Extracting from our deep uh, thoughts today, I would like to bring up and am amplify what <clears throat> Stuart was saying and what Lote was saying. Stuart was talking about there are two feedback loops that have different logics, but they are linked. It's about levels. Lote was talking about the idea of plasma and being formed via a magnetic. It's an interactive. And what's important about evolution is what is conserved and transferred? It's the interaction between organism and environment. It's not the species, it's not the individual, that, that dissolves. So just give you, I'll give you one example because we need to be talking about concrete experiments. And Lot's point is what have been the experiments in this area? For nine years, I worked with the National Institutes of Health and Walter Reed in uh, Prince George's County. Prince George's County is north of Washington, D.C. Uh, it has the lowest, uh, highest poverty, uh, highest violence levels, immigrant, black, uh, brown communities. Um, and we were asked to come into a high school to see if you, because it, it was a STEM high school, but was ranked the bottom of the 17 high schools in Prince George's. Uh, over the time, we took immigrants literally coming off the boats, people that were, uh, you know, in this violence-laced community and able to transform them into scientists. And our concrete uh, takeaway was brain freeze. If you have too much information at one level, if you are not used to that culture, you will brain freeze and lock and you, you can't move. And that's what happens with so many of these kids. What we did was give them a different form of thinking about relationships, 122 concepts of relationships and interactions that were able to get a higher level interaction with the lower facts that were coming in through their courses. And they were able to be masters of the area. And we took them to NIH, you know, 13 year old, 14 year olds, and had them ask questions that these program directors wish their own people would be asking. So that idea of dual levels, feedback loops, we have not really advanced. That's where we need to advance. So thank you, Jason. Lower, lower it. Yeah, yeah, it's similar to my ideas about selections which operate upon selections in terms of globalizations and stabilizations. And, and, and Schumpeter is here very important. Mm. Uh, 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 Jason, may I ask you? Sure, go ahead. Jason, uh, you talked about yeah. Chinese history and, and, and its, its stability or its ultra stability. Uh, just a couple of comments, which I, well, I'll, I'll say what I understand, and you can comment on it. First of all, the dynasties varied it to the extent to which they did encourage progress, innovation, and so on. Some were very, very fruitful, and as you know, others were very, very conservative. Uh, as you know, because once upon a time, China led the world in, in science as a broad brushstroke term. But also, I, I was interested to discover on a visit to China uh, a few years ago now, the extent to which in the, in the more recent times, 
the, the Chinese Communist Party, instead of repressing traditional beliefs, such as Confucianism, have actually allowed it to come back and be part of the, uh, the current ethos, as it were. I mean, you know, I visited a museum in P Peking, uh, which was dedicated to Confucianism, very, very informative, but it was being, so Confucianism, in, as I understood, in modern China is being celebrated and acknowledged as, as a, a, one of the core things which gives China its stability. What do you say? Mm, that will be another long topic. <laughs> uh, it, it's very controversial for Confucianism. We, we, we can discuss that uh, in another session, I guess. We already passed 10 minutes to our time. Uh, I think I think, yeah, yeah, Jerry had your last word. Okay, <laughs> okay. yeah, I, and I would just like to say that uh, I like your notion of developing a cyber complexity index. I, I think this is a crucial extension to Ashby's notion of uh, stability or, or homeostasis stability issue. So that cool. this uh, concept which is uh, actually introduced a long time ago by, by Charles Saunders Peirce uh, as part of logic uh, and the development of propositions and uh, um, uh, uh, indexical, what am I trying to say? Indexical forms of logic that are based on diagrams. So that I, I see a, a concurrence here between this notion of cyber complexity indexing and C.S. Peirce's notions of logic. And of course, it's also very consistent with the general notions of molecular biology. So uh, I like it. Great, we should look into that further together. Any more questions, friends? No? <laughs> Thank you so much, Klaus. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.